Muchas gracias, misionero Miguel Bermúdez Marín. Thank you very much, misionero Miguel Bermúdez Marín. May God continue blessing you greatly and continue to help you at all times in favor of the entire Church of the Lord. Greetings to all the brethren there in Barquisimeto, state of Lara, Venezuela, where he is. Congregation that the Reverend Naun Leon pastors and all the brethren there, and also those who are through the satellite Amazon or Internet, and all those who are here present as well, who visit us from different countries, and those from Puerto Rico as well. May God bless us greatly this morning through His Word. We turn to Matthew chapter 11 verse 20 there in the subject that we have for today that we will be watching and listening to the mystery of the divine simplicity preached on November 3rd of 1997 on Buenos Aires, Argentina let us read in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 and on, it says, Then began he to abroad the cities wherein most of the mighty workers were done, because they repented not. Who unto the Chorazin? Who unto the Bethsaida? For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repent long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. You may please be seated. He tells us in the message, the sword of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, preached on Friday, February 8th, of 2008 in Guyana, Brazil, it says, everything that he will be doing will be transmitted to the human race through the words that the Holy Spirit will be speaking through the ministries of the two olive trees. God will place his word in the mouth of these two olive trees, which are the ministries of Moses and Elijah being repeated at the last day. And therefore, the two-edged sword, the word of God, that has been in the mouth of the Lord, using it and speaking through his different messengers, notice, 
In the messenger of the seventh age, on different occasions, we find that two-edged sword discerning the thoughts of the heart of the people and also speaking things into existence and also speaking out of existence diseases and many other things. We find on occasions when it was said to the Reverend William Branham, whatever you say will happen. The sword was placed in his mouth. We find that he spoke squirrels into existence on different occasions. They were created by that creative word. He also spoke to resurrect a little fish that had died and was floating in the river waters where he was fishing, and he resurrected that little fish. Anyone may think, but such a great power of creation to be used for the resurrection of a little fish? And didn't Christ use it to multiply the little fish also, the fish, and multiply the loaf of bread? There is no small thing for God. Everything that God created is great before God, whether it is a little fish or something smaller than a little fish. Notice in the message, Christ is the mystery of God revealed on page 82. He tells us, she is now risen and by the power of the vindicated word promised to her. Amen. How a bride holds that promise. He told me he would return after me. I believe it. Mm -hmm. See? Yes, sir. To meet her headship, her redeemer, her husband, her king, her lord, her lover, her savior in the provided meeting place. He's got a place to meet them. You know, he, the bridegroom, don't leave out nothing. He's got the ring, the identification. He's got the robe that she wears, her clothing, see? And he's got the provided place to meet her that's in the air. Now notice, in the message, is this sign of the answer? Let us make a pause on this, on this one. And in the message, is this a sign of the end, sir? On page 18 and 19 it says, and that's right, because in the formation of the world, the world was formed before there was light. We all know that. God moved upon the waters. And... Then, in the beginning, he spoke for light, and naturally, down under there, in the age that formation was. And there he draws the cornerstone and the ages. And like a molar or lace below, in the part below the age, that light had never come upon the stone and he draws a cornerstone and the ages. And when all them got up, and I told them to watch that, and all them come up to look in, but he said, while they were looking in, he looked out of the corner of his eyes, I believe it was, and watched me. I slipped off to one side and started going toward the west, and he draws a cornerstone and an hour toward there. And he writes, west, toward the setting of the sun, coming up a hill, and the ages there as well, and draw a narrow toward the ages, going down a hill, coming up a hill, going down a hill, getting smaller and smaller, and went all the way out of sight. And there he writes, the island equals and a cornerstone, the ages and he writes, the age of the cornerstone. What Brother Miguel was talking about of Puerto Rico 
where this great message has come out from that the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ brought to us from this age of the cornerstone. And notice, here, there have been already a couple of times when he talks about something, and I haven't talked to him for several days now. He talks about something, and I haven't talked to him for several days now. And he talks about something, and I was going to talk about that as well. We kind of concur. And I had this one to read it to you where he wrote there, the island equals a cornerstone, and he writes the age of the cornerstone. Look where he places the age of the cornerstone represented on an island, because it is on an island where God had brought this glorious message, and it is where he will culminate his work. He began by giving the revelation there to John on the Isles of Patmos, and it will culminate on the island of Puerto Rico, bringing us that great promise, which is not only for Puerto Rico, but for every place where God's elects are, the promise of transformation. Notice, he goes on to say, in the message we are reading, Christ is the mystery of God revealed. Everything has been all provided. He's got the wedding supper already set. Guests already invited, already chosen. All the angels and standing around, his servants at attention. And he writes, Resurrection by the Word, by Elijah and Moses. Remember that the resurrection will be by the spoken word. And the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and shall arise. He goes on to say in the message, the sword of the king. And now, we find him also speaking to nature, speaking to a snowstorm that was coming and was going to cover the whole place where he was hunting, the entire forest. He would die and those who were with him if that storm hit the place where he was. But the Holy Spirit told him, Speak to it, and it will go away. God placed his word in the mouth of that man of God, of that prophet. He spoke to it, and the storm went away. Sometimes it is more difficult to tell a person to go away and the person goes away than to tell the storm to go away. And now, we also find him speaking out of existence the tumor that was on one of his wife's ovaries, who was in Tucson, Arizona, and he was in Jeffersonville, Indiana. There is no distance for the creative word of God. That is why we must have the antennas well aligned and everything well connected. Because the third pool will also benefit at an international level. And thus, you may be able to see what is happening there. Remember the soldier, the Roman officer, who came to Jesus to tell him that his servant was sick? And Jesus said, I am coming and will heal him. And the Roman officer said to him, You don't need to go. I am a man of authority. And I tell such and such soldier to go. And he goes and does what I say. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says that he had not found in Israel such a faith as he found in him. He said the word, and then the young man was healed. In the book of quotations, page 28, he tells us, paragraph 232, 
It says, So, I sure hope that I live to see the day when we Americans will have that kind of faith. Just speak the word, Lord, and my servant will live. Oh, it'll be a great day. And he writes, speak the word. And he draws a star of David and he writes, third pool. Because that is the third pool which will be manifested, which is the power of God by the word being spoken. He goes on to say, we find many cases like this as well, repeated in the life of the Reverend William Branham, as we also saw in the Apostles Peter and the Apostle Paul, and other Apostles as well. He also spoke salvation for the children of a Christian woman, and they came crying to the feet of Christ at the moment he spoke that word because the request of the mother of those young men was the salvation of her children, because salvation is for eternity. And on page 36, paragraph 301, it says, Paul told the Roman, said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou and thy house shall be saved. If you've got enough faith for your own self to be saved, have faith enough, no matter how wayward that boy is or that girl is, they'll be saved anyhow. God somehow, if he has to lay them on their back, lay there in a hospital, dying, they'll be saved. God promised it. The inheritance. Oh, and they shall be there, said Isaiah, and all their offspring with them. And he writes, faith for the salvation of the children and of all of our relatives. They are our inheritance. And here on that occasion, he was representing all of our relatives in the children of our sister Hattie Wright. And remember that in the tenth vision, there, at that stage, there will also be that opportunity to claim in other words, for that request of the children of God to be fulfilled, in which many will come to the feet of the Lord. And thus, God will give them eternal life. We will have them for eternity. To ask for anything material is something temporary for some time. But to ask for salvation for one's relative or for oneself, that is for all eternity. It is the best thing that one can ask for oneself or for one's relatives. And now, we have seen that that creative Word of God has been manifested in different messengers in which Christ has been, the angel of the covenant, who is the one with the sword, the word, but he places it in the mouth of his messengers and the Holy Spirit himself speaks through them. And that is the sword coming out of the mouth of Christ, of the Messiah, of the Holy Spirit. That sword coming out through a man. And what that man is speaking is fulfilled. Why? because that is the Word of God. On one occasion, the Reverend William Branham was on a mountain praying, and something fell in his hand. And when he looked, it was a sword, a sword. And he says that he was afraid of blade weapons. Almost all Americans are afraid of blade weapons. 
and he said, A sword. And the voice of the Holy Spirit said to him, It is the king's sword. And what is the voice of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is Gabriel. We see it in different places where he writes it. And look, that voice that always spoke to him, we see and identify who it was. And he says, the sword of a king? And he was told, no, the king's sword. That is, the sword of God, which is the word of God. And in the message, why speak, cry? On page 47, he tells us, God, give me courage to take that sword of the word that he put in my hand about 33 years ago and hold it and march forward to the third pool is my prayer. And he writes, the sword 33 years ago equals the word for his age. And he also writes there from 1930, he writes line 1963 and 1965. He goes on to say, And now that sword is the word that God placed in the heart and mouth of that man that God sent for the seventh stage of the church, a man with both consciences together. Therefore, by being in the subconscious, because he could pass from the conscious to the subconscious being awake, when passing to the subconscious, he sees the sword that is passing to the subconscious, that is where he sees all of that and sees the sword. And in the message, trying to do God a service, on page 11, it says, And one morning, the Lord said, Go up in the top of Sabino Canyon. And he draws a cornerstone and the edges. And I was up there holding up my hands, praying. I felt something strike my hand. It was a sword. Here he's telling it. Back then was on July 14th of 1963, and here he's telling it in November 27th of 1965. I felt something strike my hand. It was a sword. And he writes, the king's sword equals the word at the top part. Now you can just imagine how you'd feel standing there by yourself and there is a knife in your hand about that long. I pulled it down and looked at it. It was just a knife, one of them. I am scared of a knife. Anyhow, and he had a metal, something like one of this knife, like pot metal or something, real sharp and narrow. Had a sheath around it here, where the dealers used to, to keep from cutting one another's hand. And he had a pearl in the handle here. Just fit my hand exactly. Well, I rubbed my face and looked back. Right on that same spot the other day. And I saw a little white dove come down. And he writes, dove. I'll tell you about that later. And I was holding that in my hand. And I thought, that's strange. Now, Lord I'm losing my mind. There is no one here. I'm miles from anybody. And here is a sword. I had my hands up. And where did it come from? 
And I thought, that's the strangest thing. Now look here, it's a sword. See, hit it, and it was a sword. And I said, there's nobody here standing here. I'm up on top of this rock. And there he draws a cornerstone and the ages. Plumb out top of the mountain. And you couldn't even see Tucson from there. It was so far down. I thought, now, that's a strange thing. Now, it's got to be in this vicinity somewhere, somebody that could create and make a sword and put it in my hand. I said, it could only be the very God that created a ram for Abraham, could create those squirrels that you've heard. And I said, here is the material, three different kinds of materials in it. And I'm holding it in my hand just as real as anything else I could hold in my hand. And he reads, the sword of gold, pearl, and silver. And I heard a voice said, that's the king's sword. And I thought, now, where did that come from? Was right along there in the rocks somewhere. And I held in my hand like that and I said, a king's sword? And I looked around and the sword was gone. And I said, a king's sword? That's too the knight with a sword I think that's right the army or some way the knight with it you know and I said well that's what that was probably for it means that maybe I'm to lay hands upon ministers or something like that to make them minister and then I a voice spoke back again and said the king's sword. Not a king. The king's sword, see? I thought, now, I'm either beside myself, my mind has slipped, or there's something taking place. There's somebody standing around here by me. And he draws a star of David, and he writes, Brother Branham thought that his mind had been transformed. Remember that on Mount Transfiguration, there, Jesus was adopted while still being in his body, which was created by God in the Virgin. He was adopted. And Moses and Elijah were there. And in that adoption of Jesus, then the work for which he was sent was carried out, the fulfillment of his first coming, which at the end was to fulfill the purpose for which God has sent him, fulfill his first coming and die on Calvary's cross. That is, the adoption was in that body that he had there, who could lay down his life. What? And brethren, these things are true. I don't know how to tell you. You've always seen it always happen that way. And it's, I couldn't understand it. It's the strangest feeling. And he draws a star of David. And I stood there and I thought, now, even who that is that talked to me all my life, since a little bitty baby boy, he's standing right here. And I can't see him at all. I said, the king's sword? That would be, God is the king. And what is this sword? The word, it's been placed in your hand. Said, don't fear of death. It's your ministry. Oh, my. Down of the mountain I went, crying, screaming, 
top of my voice, jumping over rocks, and I went down, told my wife, and said, I'm not going to die, see? It's my ministry. And he writes, I'm not going to die. I told her to get with Billy Paul here and take the children. I said, now I don't have anything, but the church will see that you all don't go hungry and think. I'll meet you across the border. And he writes, across the border. And in a question mark, what border? And also, in the book of the seals, he tells us something there about the sword as well. On page 559 he says and let us also see this one over here what he wrote there let's have both books he says in Sabino Canyon, sitting up there that morning, I had my hands up, and the wind had blown my old black hat down. When I was standing there with my hands up praying, and said, Lord, God, what does this mean? I can't understand it, Lord. What am I to do? If it's my going home time, let me go up here. It's where they'll never find me. I don't want nobody to be mourning around. If I'm going, I want just the family to think that I just took and walked. And they won't find me. Hide me away somewhere. If I'm going to go away, why let me go? Maybe Joseph will find my Bible laying here. And he writes, Joseph, someday, and let him use it. See, if I'm going away, let me go, Lord. And there he writes, Joseph equals his type of Christ. Joseph is coming means Christ is coming in typology. I had my hands out and all at once something hit my hand. And he writes, the king's sword. I don't know. I can't say. Did I go to sleep? I don't know. Or did I go into a trance? I don't know. Was it a vision? I can't tell you. Only thing I can say is that just the same thing like them angels was. And it struck my hand. And I looked, and it was a sword. And it had a pearl handle, real pretty, and had a guard over it with gold. And the blade looked like something like a chrome, like silver, only it was real shiny. And it was so feather edge sharp. Oh my, and I thought, isn't that the prettiest thing? Just fit my hand. I thought, that's awful pretty. But I said, hey, I'm always afraid of them things, a sword. I thought, what will I do with that? And there he writes in the other book, the king's sword. Hand it over to another. And he also writes there, the third pool. And just then, a voice shook down through there that rocks the rocks, said, it's the sword of the king. And then I come out of it. The sword of the king. Now, if it said a sword of a king, but it said the sword of the king, and there is only one, the king, and that's God, and he has one sword, that's his word what I live by, that so help me God, standing over his holy desk here, with this holy word laying here. It's the word. And also in the message, standing in the gap, on page 24, 
he says. Here he also makes that a small narration on June 23rd of 1963. He says, then in Sabino Canyon, that morning, praying, we read all of or majority of the places to he speaks a little more in each of them and give us more light of what happened there. Then in Sabino Canyon that morning, praying and wondering what would happen, holding my hand out to God, up on top of that mountain, that sword dropped into my hand with a pearl handle and its guard over it and a long blade about three foot long and glistered like pot metal or like chrome. Notice, here he gives the length. In the other places he didn't. He said about three foot long. It would be almost a meter because a meter are 39 inches around there. So it would be like a meter, a meter and just a little bit less, which is 39. It would be almost a meter. And glistening like pot metal or like chrome, razor sharp. And I didn't know what it was. And I said, I'm afraid of these things. And just then a voice spoke that shook the canyon, said, This is the sword of the Lord. And the sword of the Lord is the word of the Lord. For the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And there he writes, The sword of the Lord of the King. And let us go on to page 25 of this same message. It says, It says, said it was one morning like it was a vision, got up in the bed about three or four o'clock in the morning, something like that, and saw this happen, and said he screamed, looked like for days, Brother Bill, come back, and Roy and I have been real brothers. We live together and hunt together, and we're just brothers. And he screamed for me till he was hoarse in his throat. Come back. Bring him back. Bring him back. Crying, he said. And here come that pillar of fire coming back, or a cloud come back. And he set me at the head of the table. And I had been changed. And he writes, the 40 lacha, 50 lacha. It was a mystery to Brother Roy, me being changed, to look different. And he writes, 50 lacha. I lay this up here for something I want to remember. Being changed. And he writes, from 40 lacha to 50 lacha when I give him the interpretation of it. And there he writes, He had changed. I will see you on the island. And also, in the message, what is the attraction on the mountain? On page 24 and 25, it says, I went up in the canyon, climbed plumb up where the eagles was flying around. I was watching some deer standing there. I knelt down to pray and raised up my hands, and a sword struck my hand. I look around, and I thought, What's that? I'm not beside myself. Here's is that sword in my hand, bright, shiny, 
glistering in the sun. And he draws a little cornerstone and sparkles. I said, now there is not people in miles of me. Way up here in this canyon. Where could that come from? I heard a voice said, that's the king's sword. I said, a king knight, a man with a sword? He, the voice, come back, said, not a king's sword, but the king's sword, the word of the Lord, said, fear not, it's only the third pool. The third pool. It's the vindication of your ministry. And he writes, the final vindication. And he writes, the king's sword, Revelation 19, 11 to 21, 1, 10 to 20, chapter 2, and also 10, 1 to 11. And he also writes there, not outside of the body. And here he writes, the word materialized in a sword. Our brother William goes on to say here in this message, and now, let's see another place. I have a very important place here where he tells us about this. This is on page 136, paragraph 1208 of the Book of Quotation. And it is a passage that comes from questions and answers of the year 1964, preached by the Reverend William Branham. He is asked, Will the bride, will the bride before Jesus comes, will she have all powers of Holy Ghost to perform miracles, raise dead, and so on, as in the latter rain? Or is this latter rain for the 144,000 Jews? Will all the minister have this? Are we, or are we just waiting for the coming? Now the answer. Now, latter rain, 144,000 Jews? No. That isn't. That they won't. That, that when, that's when Elijah and Moses. There is where the miracles take place. The things that the people have been looking for, the Pentecostals for miracles, that's where that all takes place in that under them. See, that's Elijah and Moses. And Brother William goes on to say, And now, according to these words and those we read before, who will have that divine power? The two olive trees, Moses and Elijah, will have the creative word in their mouth to speak and things will happen by the creative power of the creative word of God. In the book of quotations on page 21 remember that by that time those ministries will be adopted in the veil of flesh that he will have at that time. On page 21, paragraph 174, it says, Oh, if the great holy church only realized its power to do these things, but there's so much doubt and fear and trembling, wondering if it will. Could it happen? As long as that exists, the church can never stand upright. There can be no doubt in the church. And when every talk of fear is banished and the Holy Spirit is completely in control of the church, then all fears are gone. And that church has the power, see? Why they have everything that heaven owns behind them? They're ambassadors of the throne. And he writes, the throne. And he also writes, ambassadors of the throne. And also on page 24, 
paragraph 199 it says he'll pour out that golden oil of the Holy Ghost upon that church brother fire will fall from heaven and signs and wonders will take place like you've never seen before. Yes, sir. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good will to give you the kingdom. And he writes, Zechariah 4, 1 to 14. He writes, golden oil equals the Holy Spirit. Revelation 7, 2 and 11, 3. Remember that it is from the two olive trees, the ministries of Moses and Elijah, that that oil comes out that Zechariah speaks of in chapter 4. He goes on to say, To whom would he pass the two-edged sword? To the two olive trees. There is no dispute about that. The book of Revelation in chapter 11 states that they will have the power to shut heaven. They will have the power to speak into existence the plagues from the book of Revelation. Therefore, they will have the creative word in their mouth, and therefore the two-edged sword, the king's sword, coming out of his mouth. And now, Throughout the history of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have seen in whom the sword of the king has been, the word of God, the creative word. It's been in the mouth of the different messengers, the different prophets that God has sent. The Holy Spirit has been in them, and therefore the creative word, which has been spoken through his messengers in the Holy Spirit. To have that knowledge is important, but we cannot stop there. We have to see where the king's sword is promised to be, according to what we have seen. The prophecies say that the two olive trees will have the power to close the heavens, to speak plagues into existence, or whatever they want to speak. Therefore, the creative word of God will be in his mouth, in the mouth of Moses and Elijah, and therefore, the king's sword will be there in the last day. To find the king's sword, well, we look to find where the word of God will be for this time, and therefore, we will be looking where it was promised. And notice in the book of quotations on page One hundred and seven, paragraph nine hundred and thirty-three, it says, because it was revealed to him what the great truth of Christ was. And today people say it's a denomination. It's Jesus Christ, the new birth, revealed in you that he has the preeminences and he might express his words. And anything that he promised in these last days, he can bring it to pass through his body as he is working. And there he draws a star of David and he writes the last days and the cornerstone and the ages. And he also writes, every promise is fulfilled through his body. He goes on to say, may God allow us to see the sword of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the last day in which we live. And therefore, see who was the one who inherited the blessing of receiving the King's sword that was in the Reverend William Branham in whom we see it. He will be the one to whom he passed it to and to whom he or from whom he asked God to allow him to pass it to another person who was faithful and who was, let's see how it says here, honored. And look in the Feast of the Trumpet in that message on page 8 he tells us 
Otro lugar donde another place where habla del Cañón he Sabino, speaks of Sabino Canyon, he says. Sabino, then one day in Sabino Canyon, while God called me early in the morning up there, I was up with my hands in the air, praying, and a sword came into my hands. You know that. I stood there and looked at it, just natural as my hand is now, not knowing what it meant. And it was left me with a voice that said, This is the sword of the king. And then later, when the angel of the Lord revealed it, it was the word in the hand. Who revealed to him what the sword was? The angel of the Lord. And he draws a star of David, and he writes, The king's sword equals the word. And on page 571, of the Book of the Seals, at the at that page 571, it says, I pray that, just before that, Lord, I pray that you keep sickness away from us. May it come to pass that when people become sick, that they'll remember the present and all-sufficient blood of the Lord Jesus lays on the altar to make an atonement. And I pray that they'll be healed immediately. And I pray that you keep the power of Satan away from them to discourage them or to try to make them make cults. Oh, just keep all the power of the enemy away, Lord. Sanctify us to thy word, grant it, Lord. Then, Lord, I pray that you'll help me. I'm beginning to fade away. Lord, I know my days can't be too many more. And I pray that you'll help me to let me be true, Lord, and honest and sincere, that I may be able to bear the message as far as it's ordained for me to bear. And when it comes to that time that I must lay down and get down to the river and the waves begin to come in, O oh God, may I be able, and he writes Elijah, to hand this old sword over to somebody else. And he writes the word to Moses and Elijah, the angel of Jesus. Thou be honest with it, Lord. I will pack the truth. The word Moses and Elijah, coma, the angel of Jesus. Now notice, already there he was saying that he had little time left. But two years later, in 65, he left. But his ministry was going to continue on. It wasn't like many of the time of Brother Branham expected, who are still waiting for Brother Branham to come and fulfill the third pool when what Brother Branham is going to fulfill rather is the ministry that was in Brother Branham. Just as it happened with Elijah, God tell him to anoint Yehu, asking of Israel, Hazael, asking of Syria, and Elisha, as prophet instead of Elijah. And he tells him that. But he didn't anoint the first two. But he went and anointed Elisha. And the sons of the prophets, when they saw that Elisha was doing the same thing that Elijah did, what did they say? The spirit of Elijah rested upon Elisha. That is the attitude they had to assume. Those who were seeing that work which the ministry of Elijah was carrying out in his second manifestation to see Elijah anointing those kings but through another veil of flesh. Just as it happened, and notice there God took Elijah. He was taken. He was raptured even more so for them. It was more convincing that Elijah had to come in that body to fulfill that promise. However, he did it, but in another veil of flesh. So it happened with Moses, but this one, his body was later taken by the archangel Michael. 
There in Jude, he tells us about that. When the devil contended for the body of Moses, notice, and there, God made him the promise to deliver the Hebrew people from Egypt, from bondage, to bring them out, and to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And Moses left. Were they going to wait for Moses to come again in the body to bring them into the promised land? No. They went ahead. How? By the same ministry that took them out. It was the same ministry that was going to take them into the promised land, but in another veil of flesh, in Joshua. Notice how he shows us two very but very clear examples there. Then, when Brother William told us on many occasions that he was going to be transformed with all of us, and that he was going to be bringing in a tent because he had been invited to bring the revelation of the thunders and to give the rapturing faith and all those things. And God, in his plan and in his program, took him away. But he asked for more time. He comes back and gives us a very but very big revelation and tells us, Those of you who have it in there, let us see if I have it. What did he tell us? When you see that prophet messenger of the seventh seal, you will be seeing the coming of the Lord with Moses and Elijah, fulfilling the prophecies of the third pool in the vision of the great tent cathedral. And there you will see me again. I love you very much. Notice where we would be seeing again the ministry that he had. Then, at a certain time of the tent vision, when he said to me, when you see that lady come out there pushing that stretcher around there, is where the resurrection will be happening. And then all messengers will be with their groups in our midst. But that is at the final stage. In the meantime, God has to be fulfilling before that what was spoken through the mouth of our beloved brother William Soto Santiago. That word can't fall to the ground. God has to be working in the midst of his church in a great tent cathedral. Where? On an island. In the island of the Lamb in Puerto Rico. I believe that it has been spoken very clearly because God fulfills his word in every age and in every dispensation according to how he already has it programmed. It is not something at the last minute, let's settle it over here. No. He had all this already since before the foundation of the world. That is why he told me, Benji, that is going to be way too small. And why did he tell me that is going to be too small for me? And he always said, that is going to be too small for Benji. You see, he was already talking, prophesying, everything that was going to happen in this place. Many times he would say, you may begin with just a few people hearing in that time of teaching. But then, this is going to become tiny for all that is going to be happening, not only in this place, but in all the places where them churches are prepared. And our brother William continues saying, Therefore, we will again see and hear the same one who said, Let there be light, and there was light, who has been speaking through his different messengers through the different times, and which spoke through Jesus, spoke through the apostles, spoke through the different messengers of each age, spoke through the Reverend William Branham, and we will be seeing him manifested, veiled and revealed in the last day, in whom he will place the ministries of the two adversaries of Moses and Elijah, and therefore we will see the anointed one of God anointed with the Holy Spirit, with the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth.
And on page 28 of the Book of Quotations, paragraph 236, notice it says, and if God sends a representative, and he anoints this representative, and send it into the world, the people must obey that representative. It's always been that way, all down through the Bible. And he writes, to the prophet, the anointing of a representative. And also on page 36, paragraph 297, And then, if God has sent us to his ambassadors, all the power that's in heaven, all that God is, all of his angels and all of his power stands behind our words if we are correctly and ordained, sent messengers to the people. God has to honor the word, for he has so solemnly written that whatever you bind on earth, that will I bind in heaven, whatever you lose on earth, that would I lose in heaven. And he draws a cornerstone and the ages. And he writes, Ambassador of God equals heaven will support it, what the messenger will bind or unbind. He continues to say, there will be a man. There will always be an instrument, a veil of flesh, through which God, through his Holy Spirit, through the angel of the covenant, will veil and reveal himself and speak his word and therefore his creative word and will open the scripture to us in this end time and the blessings promised for our time will come into existence, which will be spoken and be in fulfilled. Watch that word, that two-edged sword. In the message, five definite identifications of the true church of the living God on page 39, it says, Who is it he is addressing it to? To those that's already in the church. When you're in Christ, you're in his body. Is that right? Then you are members of the church. Grace be unto you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There he's quoting from Paul. He goes on to say, How did he do it? What did he do it? They had reached Jordan. They crossed into the promised land. And they were setting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Here it is. Blessed us together with heavenly blessings. The teaching of the word. As the church, the called out ones that's in Christ Jesus. As we are setting together in heavenly places. Like the church, when we're born in Christ Jesus. The sainted, called out ones. Oh my Somebody he can teach something to. Had so much trouble with the Corinthians, but not this church. He could teach them great things. And there he writes, the teaching of the word, heavenly blessings. They are the blessings of this time that will come into existence such as our adoption. He goes on to say, Who will have for the last day the two-edged sword, the king's sword? We have already seen 
that it is the two olive trees. But the question then arises, and who will be Elijah and who will be Moses in the last day? The question is a very good one. You must discover it when you see the two-edged sword, the creative word of God. And then you will be able to say, it is coming out of a veil of flesh and find out what his name is, and then you will know who is the heir of the king's sword for the last day. For the king of kings, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, to speak that creative word through that veil of flesh. We will see all of that in the fulfillment of the third pool, which will culminate, we will have its peak part in a tent. Now, if it is a veil of flesh, then he must be alive. Fulfilling those prophecies. We will see all of that in the fulfillment of the third pool. What are we going to see? That word coming out through the mouth of that messenger. That was seen by the Reverend William Branham the king's sword in the hand of the prophet, of a man. That is the third pool, the seventh seal and its work for the last day. That is the third pool, the fulfillment of the tenth vision. That is the third pool, manifested in the midst of Christianity, in the midst of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will come through the sword of the King of kings and Lord of lords, coming out of the mouth of the two olive trees. It comes forth from God through the angel of the covenant, the Holy Spirit, to him who is anointed with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit operating the ministry of Elijah and the ministry of Moses. Those are the ministries promised to be manifested with the king's sword. And then we'll see the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, and in the message. The indictment on page 66, it tells us, I pray that you will save everyone, Lord. May there come forth a revival of the just and a great power come among the church just before its going. It's not hard to pray that, because you promised it. And we're looking, Lord, for that third pool that we know that will do great things for us in our midst. I am yours, Lord. I lay myself on this altar, just as consecrated as I know how to make myself. Take the world from me, Lord. Take the things from me that's perishable. Give me the imperishable things, the Word of God. May I be able to live that Word so closely till the Word will be in me and I in the Word. Grant it, Lord. May I never turn from it. May I hold that King's sword so tightly and grip it so closely. Granted, Lord. And there he writes, the king's sword. He goes on to say, we are required to locate the veil of flesh, to locate the ministries of the two olive trees, and also to locate the king's sword, the word of God pertaining to this end time being spoken. That is what Israel is waiting for. And also the elect of Christianity of the last day are waiting for the same thing. May God help us all to see the king's sword of the king of kings and lord of lords in the ministries of the two olive trees promised for the last day. May he allow us to see the veil of flesh and see those ministries working and see that word coming out of his mouth. See that two-edged sword coming out of his mouth in the message, possessing all things. He tells us on page 30,
I want his will to be done, mine to be put in the back, and his will to be done. I want to have the victors march, not because it's me, because I know that the gospel that he preached is suffering today on account of denominational man-made dogmas and everything else. The great victory that we should have has been held back by the enemy. God, let me pull this sword. Let it sparkle and shine and march forward. Let my will be in the back and his word going in front like that, a sharp to edge sword making a way. And he writes, the sword, and he also writes, on the front, the two edge sword making way. And our brother William goes on to say, that will give us faith to be transformed and taken with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and also faith for divine healing. In other words, that which will be happening, that teaching under the tent will give us what? The rapturing faith. That which will be happening there will give us the rapturing faith and also divine healing. And the healing that we all desire is the healing of the body, to be transformed, to be changed. Well, that is already happening from within us, because it is around the world that we are going to be transformed. The same thing happened with Abraham and Sarah. He says, that will give us faith to be transformed and taken with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and also faith for divine healing. Because in the tenth vision, there was divine healing by the creative word of God being spoken by the two-edged sword. And notice in the book of quotations on page 26, there is also a place there where he tells us in paragraph 214, Now, we're trying each night to find something that I'm seeking after. And that is that God, by a vision, had told me that my ministry is making its third change. And I'm longing for it to begin here at the tabernacle. I don't know whether it will or not, but I am longing for it to do that. And I trust that it will be some way that will be able to preach the gospel in such a way or do something that will help the suffering humanity to a happier way of life and a more healthier way of life. It's my sincere desire. And he writes, the third pool, the tenth vision. And also in the message, standing in the gap, on page 43, there he tells us, here is almost at the end of the message, When he's praying, he says, Heavenly Father, we thank you now for your goodness and your mercy. You are ever in our midst. Give me, Lord, oil in my lamp. Give me the rod of the Lord that I might stretch it out. He says, Give me the rod of the Lord that I might stretch it out upon over the sick and afflicted, that I might bring it out upon to bring deliverance to those who are needy and judgment to those who are rejecting it. And he writes, Oil in the lamp. And he writes, Deliverance to those who are needy. 
judgment to those who reject it. Let us stand up and thus we leave on this occasion and this important subject that we have for today the mystery of the divine simplicity there's another place Notice on 23, since in that one of standing in the gap, he says something there, but in this quote, see page 23, paragraph 186, it says, she ran into the city and she said, come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? And he never did that one time to a Gentile. Why? He left it till this day. That's what he said here. He in the days when the Son of Man shall reveal himself from heaven. He is revealing himself. Now. And he writes, Elijah, to the church for mercy. The next time he reveal himself, and he writes, in Moses and Elijah, is in destruction. And he writes, sixth seal, to those who rejected the message. And he writes, Elijah and Moses. And he also writes, the Son of Man reveals himself twice. May God continue to help us to understand and see that two-edged sword in the midst of the church, revealing to us through the word, through the message brought to us by the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything we need to know in order to obtain the perfect faith, the rapturing faith, the mystery of the divine simplicity. We immediately leave with us our dear brother and friend, Dr. William Soto Santiago.